What you're going to hear are bits and pieces of who we are, where we've been, the things we've seen. You will see what a poor choice looks like. You will see what regret looks like. Listen to the heartbeat of a prison. Listen to life on the inside. Inside my room, my face against the wall. I heard her crying in the dark. I was 19 um, when I, I was first arrested, and I went through two trials. And the second one, ultimately, I was convicted and sent here. I was sent up to the big house. How do you describe life in prison? Uniformity. Everything is structured. The time you get up, the time you have to shower, what time you go to bed, how loud you talk, when you talk, when you get your mail, when you can have something to drink. I don't think there are enough words to tell you what it's like to be in here. I hope you never have to find out. In 1994, my boyfriend and my co-defendant killed a guy. I'm not really sure which one did because I wasn't there. I came in afterwards and helped them get rid of the body. So I'm. We had to, um, we had a choice to either take it to trial or to all plead guilty for second degree murder. Um, I took the plea bargain for 35 years for second degree murder. I was in high school, senior year in high school. There's not a day that goes by that I do not regret the choices that I made. You know, this, uh, I didn't have to be here. This did not have to be my life, and it is, and you know, Whatever higher power exists, you know, he, he threw this to me, and I'm making the best of it, but, yeah, I regret my life. I look at my mother now, and I regret what I took her through, and I look at, you know, the modeling opportunities that I had, and I regret that I didn't attend, and the schools that I could have gone to, I regret that I didn't, you know, and, and just figuring out why I made those choices, that, that is, that's, it's, it's hard to deal with, it really is. Living here on the inside, inside my room, my face against the wall. I still hear her crying. They are individuals, but they are not unique. What these female inmates share in common are painful memories, regrets, and lives yet to be fully lived. Crimes cause their lives to intersect in prison. Behind razor wire and steel bars, we write. We write and remember that we are women. We have loved, we have hated, we have laughed, and we have cried. We are women. And behind razor wire and steel bars, we, we rise. We are going to be between them double doors in five minutes. Right right there. There. You'll be all right. I won't. I don't have on a padded bar. Oh, my God. It's performance night for the Raleigh Women's Prison Repertory Company. Using their own words, these inmates will share their personal stories. What you need to remember is this one right here. This is where you keep forgetting. If you stumble across something, get very emotional, like you're just feeling that, that what's coming up next. Just grab your chest, you know, squeeze your eyes like it's hurting you so bad. 
I'm serious. Just do what it. Is yeah. what are you interested in the shirt? Check yeah. as much as right. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the show. We're so glad you're here. There are so many people over there that they have had to go get extra chairs to put right. out there. So we're going to wait four more minutes. So y'all got four mm -hmm. minutes. Can I have the attention this time? Mm -hmm. We got four minutes oh, on the nose, her. and then we're going. Because my arm did not have a big one. The making of an African princess. So about how many people do you think are in there, actually? Um, like 4,000? <laughs> we have to walk right dead in the middle of them. I'm tickled. Just tickled. <laughs> On this night, the officer guarding these women leads them in a moment of prayer before they take the stage. God, just bless each one, one by one, name by name, oh God. Bless them that they will remember their lives, bring it all back to their remembrance. God, just let someone be able to look at this and just see what these ladies are really saying to us. Oh God, speak through them and move through them this night, oh God. Amen. 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 All right. Long before the women perform, they write. The process begins at the Raleigh Correctional Center for Women. All members of the writing group need to report to the dining hall. All members of the writing group need to report to the dining hall. All right, well, we've got some stuff we need to discuss, so Regina and Toya, come on over, babes. The Women's Writing and Performance Project started in 2001. It's the only ongoing arts and corrections program in a North Carolina prison, and the only prison repertory group in the country to perform original work outside prison walls. The lights are turned down now as I lay here on my bunk, looking out upon the room filled with criminals, captured and wounded. Some of them are sleeping, some only wishing they could. Looking out at the ladies in the bed one night, I couldn't sleep, and I could hear somebody crying. I didn't know who it was, and that's where that piece came from. A lot of them are probably crying, and but no matter who she is or whether she's asleep or whether she's awake and she's crying or she's just thinking, she's remembering something from that world that helps her survive in this one. I'm on a dark stretch of highway with my best friend. She's the only person I care about in the whole world. We don't have any money and only a few clothes in an old bag. It doesn't matter though, because I'm leaving. If I had only known that I would lose my virginity in a stranger's bed, just like my friend in the next room. The women's writing group meets once a week. On this night, director Julie Fischel is trying to get the ensemble ready for a performance. Go ahead and sit on the box at the top until you speak. In the kitchen. I'm not really here to make them actors. My job is not to make them performers. My job is not to, is to be seamlessly out of the way. You know, I don't need to tell this woman that the level of distress that she shows or emotion that she shows on stage when she recounts the tale of losing her virginity at 13 is not authentic because it's her story. Short-termers, mid-termers, long-termers, re-termers. Housewives and hookers, grandmas with game, old school junkies and <laughs> lesbians who train. <laughs> I had the idea to go into the prison and see if there were any interesting stories that I could come away with. I didn't intend to stay in the prison. Author Jude Reitman started the women's writing group by helping the inmates with their own writing, she hoped to find material for herself for another book. What she soon discovered is no one could tell the women's stories better than themselves. Jude tried to help them find their voice. Some of these women have never expressed what's happened to them in their lives. And they've done so instead of through words, they've done it through inappropriate actions and those have deeply hurt them and continue to hurt them. Inside prison, I go inside myself. I go inside myself because there's nowhere else to go. Inside of myself is where I need to figure out where it all began. When they find their words, their own voice, 
they can start to articulate what has hurt them and how they could have done things differently emotionally before they reached the point where they pulled the trigger or they grabbed the knife. You knew it was wrong. You knew you were hurting me. You knew that I trusted you. I suppose it didn't matter that I was 13, that I was your blood, and that I trusted you. Almost all these women have been sexually abused. And when they write about that, when one person writes about it, it lets the others be able to talk about it. Um, it, took, it took time, but when we reached that point, we were all safe in listening and in speaking. Then, then we're going to do like a, the que uh, question and answer thing. Jude draws you, people to her. I mean, she is just a magnetic person. And I just enjoyed her. The first day, I knew that she was somebody I wanted to be around. Okay. You know, listen to this woman who had this really funny accent from New York, and she's reading all this stuff that we have written, and she, of course, you know, critiqued and edited everything, and it was funny to me. And I enjoyed her, and she brought something new to my life and to this prison. You know, this prison is having a hard time wondering what they're going to do with Jude because she's so different. And it's been a good different. So, and that, I think she really is a lot of the reason why I hung in there. She really is. The woman with the funny New York accent and big personality had to gain the inmates' trust. In time, she did. She receives no salary for her work. The prison writing project is a labor of love. It survives solely on donations. He'd smile that hidden smirk type smile when I call his name. I'd wade in the water and yell, Daddy! He'd wave from a distance. And I knew that it would only be a few more moments until I was boarding his way back to me. Sorry, y'all. I didn't mean for that to happen. All right. Let's wait for the music. Let's the music. It's all right. Okay. My dad, he loved to surf. Um, just the kind of, I guess it would be a metaphor or whatever, or the analogy. The surfboard and the way he had to balance and the way he had to control himself during that time. But he was, you know, my father was an alcoholic. He used drugs. I mean, he did everything bad, too. There were certain things. He was very creative. He was very powerful. He was very, very, very smart. And he just let it, you know, go to hell. And I was that way. You know, I was very smart very creative, you know, I had a lot of talent, and then I just let it go to hell. So, it's, you know, watching him, I took after him so much. In prison would be the least likely place you would come to find the truth. And these women tell the truth. And the truth being their emotional truth, which is much more powerful than any other reciting of events. The source of their material has a lot to do with trauma, but also to do with hope. And um, trying to figure out ways of living their life when they're looking at a life sentence. And when they're 19 and sentenced to life, and as in the case of many of my women, they're in all, also already for 20 years. You know, how do you live your life knowing that this is going to be your life? Inmate 0048606. I was 29 when I came to prison. I am the mother of two children, and now the proud grandmother of one. And I am now 41. And I was sentenced to life class C. What I hear from the women who are doing life is that this has been a lifesaver for them, and giving them something to look forward to, and to you know, showcase something about themselves that's really um, has been undiscovered in themselves. So that's been really the, the wellspring of their creativity, is the past that they have not wanted to deal with. This can happen to anyone, even though it's supposed to happen to no one. People always say there's always that lucky person who comes from a bad circumstance who makes their life perfect. And I am so grateful that there are people like that. 
but nine times out of ten that doesn't happen you know if a child if a daughter is molested by her father more than likely she's going to you know keep getting abused by men throughout her life that's just reality and that's what we write about you know we ended up here but it can happen to anybody so all work release of girls in this um, area members of the women's writing group are part of the honor grade just down the hill from the maximum security prison they sleep in these trailers, dormitory style. It's a minimum custody facility designed for inmates who work at jobs outside the prison. And they have to earn this privilege time, so. This is a real source of pride for the ladies. Yes, it is, yes, it is. They take pride in, in this area because they had to work to get here. Prison Superintendent Joyce Cornegay supports the writing project. When it first started, it was controversial and even disbanded for several months. After an evaluation by psychologists working for the Department of Corrections, the program was determined to have therapeutic value. In the report, it was determined the women's behavior improved and disciplinary actions declined. Superintendent Cornegay believes the writing process is a healthy outlet for expression and self-healing. But long term, I feel that the greatest impact is releasing all of the different type guilt and anger and just releasing all type sources that basically was a part of them committing their crimes mm -hmm. and bringing them here to um, or into the prison system. Hi, this is Kim. Um, Christina had to step away from the desk for a moment. Is there something I can help you with? As a level two inmate, Kim Stone is allowed to work outside the prison. She makes 70 cents a day at Interact, a nonprofit agency which serves victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual abuse. She hopes this work will prepare her for a career as a counselor. I try to look inside to the real person. and I think I have a gift of being able to see inside people. Probably because I've spent a lot of time looking inside myself. I see the real person who is getting high to fight away demons, probably from sexual abuse or physical abuse. Kim knows a lot about demons. She still battles her own. I remember my daddy's tears after he knocked my mother into the wall. I stood between them that day, shielding her and hating him. I remember being outside the house and hearing this thud, this bang, big bam, and I went, because they sent us out, they made my brother and I go outside. And when I went in, she was pushing herself up off the wall. And my daddy was just in a crazy, crazy drunken state. He was a mad man. He was so angry. And I really did stand between them. I wouldn't let him back at her. I didn't fight him. I just stood there like I'll be the sacrificial lamb. Just don't hit her anymore. So many times I saw myself throwing hot grease on him or I could hear the thud of the frying pan against his head but I never had the nerve. I think children who come from um, homes where there is an alcoholic don't really have a sense of normalcy. And they just spin. They're just spinning, looking for something solid to land on, looking for. And that's how I went through my teenage years, looking for something real. And because I had nothing to draw from as far as what normal was, I ended up with more crazy people in my life. The world was lost to me then. Everything was lost to me then. I was just looking for a place to land. And fortunately, it was prison. I believe had I not come to prison, that I would not be alive. And it would have happened by my own hands, I do believe. So what did she do with Chloe here? For the longest time, I stood there looking at her, looking at me. Dirty blonde hair dangling in her eyes where pooling tears refused to fall. For her, that was the edge because she knows that once they start falling, they'll never stop. How do you think that writing process has helped you sort through some of those feelings, some of those emotions? 
I firmly believe that when people continue to hold stuff inside, it's so chaotic. That's, that's, how, it, that's how your life is, chaotic. And if you can pull it out, whether you talk about it or whether you write about it, if you can get it outside of yourself, somehow it loses its power. I grew up to be a manipulator, a man-eater, and an underpaid whore. But hey, a hustle is a hustle. I remember my mother's temper tantrums, the way she would start yelling and screaming and throwing shit. And I remember my dad beating my mom. He broke her nose, he blackened her eyes, he busted her teeth out, he even raped her. I write about relationships, I write about my past, I write about a future that I hope would happen but probably won't. Um, prison, I write about it some, but mostly I write about things that take me away from here. When you write about your past, is that, when you initially started that process, was that ever difficult? Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. I came from a very dysfunctional family. I, I've done a lot of things with my life that I should not have done. And writing about that and being honest about it, yeah, it's difficult, you know, but being able to do so frees me. So I'm sure it frees a lot of other people in the group as well. But coming into the group and writing and, and forming relationships with these women, making some really good friends. It's like family more than it is friendship because we can argue and just have a, a time. <laughs> you know, women are, we are very opinionated but we come back to a loving place. We get through it. Well, you know what I miss? What do you miss? What? I miss privacy. Oh, privacy? Oh, right. Everywhere oh. I turn, there is a body. There's yeah. a body. A big body, a, big body. Body. a little body, yeah. a black body, a, black yeah. body. a white body, yeah. Yeah. and everybody in between. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of scary because you don't know how people are going to respond to you. You just never know how a person's going to feel about you, but they're going to advocate for you or be like, I don't want her in the same room with me. It's one of the hopes that through these performances the public might see all of you differently. I hope so. I know one of the responses we had, I think, I can't remember for which performance, but a gentleman was not pleased that we even had writing materials. Although you can understand, people are just in different places. But if, if you send people to prison, and you don't offer them anything that might possibly help them change, then how can you expect anything to be different when they get out? There is a misconception about abused women who lash out. It's not about anger. It's about being afraid. There's sadness, hurt, confusion, disappointment too in the midst of it all. I wasn't angry. I was afraid. What do you think might be the benefit for the public to come see work like this? I think it's important for people to know what goes on and why, why those women are there. I, I mean, the, the, the theme is that at 13, they were, by 13, they were raped or abused or mutilated. I mean, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with the society that allows that. You see their soul out there. You know, and it's damaged and it's hurting, but it's, it's so, it's so pure. I got a letter from my daughter today. She said she's thinking about killing herself because she hates her life. Her name is Kayla and she is 11 years old. She wrote, Mom, please come home. I promise I'll be good. We have certain stereotypes of the kinds of people who commit crime. Granted, crimes have been committed. Families have been impacted upon. Lives have been lost. And I've even struggled with this myself because some of these women have created um, very difficult life experiences for other people because of their choices. Twice I tried to leave you, but you forced me to stay. And now I am so glad you did, because every day is not the greatest. But I'm still here, 
they have come to certain very, very powerful reckonings within their lives of, of what they have done and what life means now. And they're willing to go out there and give people a message that says, here we are, this is what we've done. We share a common humanity with you. Where do we go from here? We are friends, we are family, we are each other's cheerleaders. Yay! Yay. Singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Wishing Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year! We let each other down, but more importantly, we lift each other up. Because we are bound by the desire to do better, to be better, and to be free. They're surprised that uh, they're being heard and that people are responding to them, who they are, not what they've done. There's that, that sense of the self that they're finding through the writing. We don't do this for pity. You know, we do this because I think they're the part of us that wants them, wants people to understand that we're just like you. You know, we, we made these choices based on our past. And yeah, we're responsible for it, but you know, we all, consequences happen to everybody. I think that's what we want people to see. <laughs> Cassandra Adams was once a member of the writer's group. Convicted of murder, she spent 10 years in prison. She says the group provided her a safe place to share her life story. You get frustrated with so many different things that you hold everything in and then you walk around and you end up realizing that you, you, not even, you don't even realize because it's so common that you're not smiling anymore, you're not laughing anymore. So after you go to that group, you start writing and dealing with your emotions. Like many of the women, she thinks in many ways prison saved her life. But as in life, happy endings are not always a guarantee. Adjusting to life on the outside has not been easy. When you are released, it is such, you just stigmatized forever. You know, when they are you a felon, I mean, I had problems finding an apartment. I have problems finding another job. I mean, it's just because of that ex-felon on my record. I had been really depressed when I first got out because I couldn't find something else. And I'm like, I did not go to college for this. Why? I mean, I got more, you know what I'm saying? I was like, I have so much more, and I'm not doing anything. So it's been discouraging. And when they get out, it's very rough, very rough. And some of my women have fallen back months before they get out because it's so scary, I think. One who fell back is Pam Smith. She was kicked out of the writer's group after she became violent during a rehearsal. The mother of three daughters, Pam came to prison in 2001. I have um, a manslaughter charge. Um, it was a domestic violation um, of me, and it just happened. Um, I didn't really have a choice in the matter. Um, I was on survival mode, survival instinct, um, and it happened. Pam says the writing project helped her find a voice she says she lost as a victim of domestic violence for many years. You make me feel like a chair. This frame is hard, huh? But it's as soft as this cushion. It came brand new, but you treated it like yard sale garbage. I never thought that I had a lot of similarities to a chair, but you know, I've been reupholstered, broken down, uh, refabricated over and over and over again. Um, and I found out that I didn't like this material, as in my past material. So I was gonna redo it um, using a more exquisite blend. And I have a lot of power with words. I feel like I'm the king of the mountain, you know? And, um, and I can be whatever I wanna be with words, you know? And that inspires me to actually achieve my aspirations. The writing group is demanding. Of the many women who have tried it, dozens have failed. Those who endure draw strength from its challenges, 
and find solace in its subtle but transformative power. Tell me what do you see when you first look at me? Do you think you'll remember my name? It seems like well, you and your song and some of the other women as well talk a lot about being seen as something more than your prison number. I'm not proud of it, but I'm not embarrassed by it. It's just that that's where I am. That's who I am right now. There's a lot more to me than just an inmate, and there's a lot more to me than just a convict and a criminal. And you know, unfortunately for the rest of my life, this is what it's gonna be, and that's who I'm gonna be, and I'll, you know, have this for forever, this this title, this, this you know, being a felon, an ex-con, or whatever. I want to kind of take that number and, and become something better, you know, and be proud that, yes, I was 0423358 for 10, 12, you know, 15 years of my life, but, you know, I was so much more before that, and I'm gonna be so much more after that. Somehow or another, I'll find my way to the place where I'm supposed to be. And I think it's the stories that I've, that I've put out into the writers group um, that continue to help me heal so that I can be the person that I need to be when my life begins on the outside. I just want to dance. Do the best that I can, learn to love who I am, I just want to shine.